Um, so um, I'm gonna just talk really briefly about sort of the timeline of what our committee, how our committee started in the, the timeline process for getting to a plan and then beyond a bit. And then I can answer questions about um, if you have questions about next steps for writing a sustainability plan or a work plan for your committee or whatever you wanna talk about in that way. I think I have just have three slides maybe I'll show and I'll, I'll share, can I share that now? Should uh, be able to. Okay, I got it. All right. So can you see that? All right. Um, so um, my, my background's in landscape architecture and I'm really interested in uh, green building and also um, creating space in the city and stormwater management. So I have a lot of interest, but my background's really in green building. So that's sort of what I've brought to the table, I think is as a specialty. And I was a farmer for many years as well, an organic farmer. So I am interested in all things landscape. Um, so I was not here when the sustainability committee was first constituted back in 2009, but it started as an ad hoc committee in Middleton and then became formally constituted in 2009. And pretty quickly the committee, um, I'm not sure exactly how their first meetings went, but they really realized they needed to have a roadmap and a, a, a plan for the city to prioritize what they would be working on. <clears throat> and so um, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the original city plan in a minute, um, but I really feel like with the sustainable city plan, which was approved in 2010, combined with some of the initial work they did on that plan in the years following that, and then the 2016 climate referendum, which was spearheaded by citizen members to actually put to a vote um, if, uh, citizens would back policy in the city of Middleton that supported climate change mitigation. Um, that was put on a ballot in 2016 and it ended up you know, passing with a 82% margin resounding yes, that citizens really did want to work on climate change. And so I think those things initially really provided us with a plan, but also the um, social and, pol and political capital to then go ahead and do some some more, um, not radical, but just move forward more quickly on some of the climate change policies we're doing currently. So from that climate referendum, I think the committee felt that they could then put forward a really strong renewable energy resolution, which um, designates goals for the city for 100% renewable energy by 2040 for the city and 2050 for the community, for community wide. And then um, from that, we received a, a planning grant from the State Office of Energy Innovation. And this was done in conjunction with Stoughton. And it was uh, seven communities total took part in an energy planning grant. And Slipstream was our energy consultant. And you're probably familiar with that um, because you've been a part of it. But that also provided yet another document which backed up our sustainable city plan and then the political capital from the referendum and then the energy resolution. It's just like the, the committee ha and city staff have really worked to build a lot of um, supporting documents and support in the community to keep taking larger and larger steps. So after that energy plan was complete in 2020, we started working on that. And um, I think because we had done a lot with sustainability up to that point, and we had a good relationship with MGE, um, they approached us about putting in the utility owned shared solar program at our airport. So that, uh, that was a large project, which we didn't have to build, thankfully, but um, it was another interesting way of working with uh, our utility on major energy, um, uh, improvements or, or providing solar energy and solar power for people who maybe can't put solar on their own houses or apartments. And then the next, the last steps um, is that we completed a rewrite of our comprehensive plan, which is the city's overarching plan. Um, and it's a 20 year plan and it's very, I think, visionary. Um, it's, I think some of it's really aspirational. And so we have, a really a seminal plan for our city now, 
but the sustainability committee realized that um, it was too overwhelming to look at that comp plan. I think there's 200 and some actions in the comp plan and they really wanted to start prioritizing the sustainability actions from that comp plan so that they had a much more bite-sized, shorter time frame um, actions and goals to pursue. And so we're in the process right now of rewriting that 2010 sustainable city plan, which is really dreadfully out of date. I mean, if you do anything in sustainability, you know that it changes so quickly that having a plan that's 12 years old is just wildly ridiculous at this point. So we're in the process of rewriting that plan and I can talk about that in the question answer. Um, our renewable energy resolution is similar to a lot of communities that have their resolutions now, um, you know, 100% energy needs will be met with renewable energy by 2040 in the city um, and 2050 by the community, which is a harder stretch goal that I don't feel like we've begun to tackle yet or really address um, to help the community move more quickly on that. And then our resolution had a lot of other things in it, which included prioritizing renewable energy projects, microgrids, resiliency plans. So there was, a, we put a lot more into the resolution than just those um, renewable energy goals. And so our sustainability um, chair of the committee put this slide together, which just helped explain to the committee members sort of the hierarchy of plans in our city and how they feed off of one another. And it's actually kind of a useful graphic, I think. It's the comprehensive plan is the large overarching plan and that encompasses housing, land use, stormwater, the economy and business, um, the green city section, um, parks and rec, all that kind of stuff is within the comprehensive plan. And it was just really unwieldy um, for the committee to look at and digest to see what should they be working on. So from that is the sustainable city plan, which draws directly from our comp plan, but we've decided to make it a three-year plan instead of a longer term thing. So our new sustainable city plan will be a three-year plan from 2022 to 2024. I think probably it'll be more like to 2025. And it will include 20 actions that come directly from our comprehensive plan and also the energy plan that Stoughton was a part of as community specific energy plans. And um, the committee really wanted to pare it down and instead of tackling everything sustainability, they wanted to really focus on um, our renewable energy resolution and climate change. So that's sort of the number one goal for the next few years. Um, and they wanna update it every three years now. So um, from, and then one other thing to note is that from the sustainable city plan that we're, it's in draft form now, I sent a copy to Tim earlier today, so maybe he could share that with you. It's not super duper long. I think it's 20 pages and it's not super wordy. Uh, might be good to scan to see um, what did we pick from those 200 and some actions from the comprehensive plan. How did we pare that down into 20 actions for the next three years? Um, but be, below the sustainable city plan, then the committee felt like they wanted to have their own work plan, which would be supportive and complementary, obviously, to city staff and to what the city's trying to do but they also wanted to get way more specific on just what individual members want to work on in subgroups or as their own pet projects or as a group to do events. And so they made a work plan which lasts one year and it includes, um, it includes things from the sustainable city plan or things that feed into our sustainable ability plan, but it also are things like um, running different types of events and sort of the what we're working on this year um, plan. So that's been helpful to sort of um, guide the, the sustainability committee on what things they should focus on. And it gives them a lot more to do rather than just waiting for me as city staff to present them with things to vote on. They actually have some agency in what they're working on and they can choose to work on specific projects. Um, and so I know that you're, I think right now, maybe looking at um, your sur a survey or how to do that. And when the, 
our original plan was written back in 2010, I would say it was, um, there was a lot of community engagement, which I feel is very important for community buy-in. I think especially in these smaller towns and cities like Stoughton, if you can get um, a group of citizens, you know, par partially from your committee, but then anyone else you can get involved in surveys, the business community, um, that really helps provide, um, I think, a base for your plan. And a lot, of, if the more buy-in you have, I think the more successful you'll be. So our, we originally did um, a business survey and a community-wide resident survey um, and combined those and, um, and then after they had the survey results, they analyzed those um, with, I think there were originally two or three consultants which worked together with the city on the original sustainability plan. And there was city budget put forward to do that. Um, and I can't remember how much, I can get you the dollar amount if you'd like, but it's like 12 years ago. So it may not even matter um, how much we spent on it back then, but um, Slipstream at that point was divided into two different firms, WEC and seventh generation perhaps. And then there was an, a third consultant that was somehow involved. Um, and those, so those firms helped the city and guided them through the planning process, which included a survey and a visioning session with, the, with city residents, which they advertised pretty heavily throughout the city. And there were quite a few people show up. I don't, it was, I don't know if it was nearly 80 or 90 people total showed up to the visioning session. That included city staff and the committee members. And um, really there it was the community who set the vision statements for and, and decided what would be in the plan. So um, they really, they, you know, the vision statements were super aspirational. Um, you know, it would say things like, Middleton is a net zero city and zero waste city and that kind of thing. So it was, you know, it seemed a bit unattainable, but that was really the community's vision. And so that's what the committee then wrote the plan to work towards. So it was very driven by the community. Um, and then I, I think the actual planning, the writing of the plan, I don't think it took a long time because it looks like the whole, the whole um, plan development only took a year total maybe even less than a year. Um, and I think looking back at how we've used that plan and then what we're faced with now, probably the biggest challenge is understanding which metrics you want to use to measure or track your, prog your progress. And um, what we've learned is that city staff has a l very little time <laughs> um, to track a lot of things, even though, even if it seems very simple, it just really gets lost in the shuffles. So I think you should only choose to track or measure the things that you really want to show progress on or need to know how you're doing progress-wise um, and select those carefully. And if you have systems in place that makes that easy, that's great. We're trying to establish some of those energy services and systems to help us track some of the information better. But that's been some of our one of our biggest challenges. And right now, We've written the narrative, we have the sections updated and ready to go in draft form for our new plan, but we're still struggling with um, how do we measure our progress and what exact metrics should the city track. So I think that's all I'm going to say for right now, um, and just we can discuss or open it up for questions. You might want me to go in a completely different direction on, on what might be helpful for you. I have a quick follow up just on what you just spoke to the um, tracking progress. Mm -hmm. So I spoke with um, someone from Monona. A few of us reached out to other communities, sustainability um, people who were either there, they're still on the committee or they were there when the their plan was written to do the same thing we're asking you to do here. Uh -huh. And he, that was another thing that he had said too was be really, um, mindful, I guess, about making sure that what you're going to measure is measurable. Mm -hmm. And he he recommended Green Tier. They had some um, already, I forget how, what he worded it, but they had some kind of like worksheets that you can already work off of. Do you use Green? Are you in the Green Tier network yes. and you use that worksheet? Yeah, we are. And they do have, um, they do have, I, I haven't actually done 
the annual report for that, but you do have to track certain metrics for that um, mm -hmm. to stay in the group and to show that your city is making progress or trending in, um, in the positive manner. Another um, useful uh, tool that I think could probably use would be LEAD. Um, and I and you know there's there's a lot of different rating systems. So there's the green building rating system, which might have building metrics and energy metrics. But there's the new lead for cities, um, which is what uh, we're a part of right now. We're going through the lead for cities certification, and I find that it has had a lot of really eye-opening metrics that we've had to get for that, um, and they're pretty high level. Um, but it's actually made me think about what that we need to track things that we hadn't been at all like there's we hadn't tracked our waste at all our waste stream in the city like sure we can get residential numbers from our waste hauler fairly easily but that's just one small that's one portion of our waste it's not the business district it's not industry and so um i think going through that lead for cities manual might also be a helpful place to look for which metrics and you know they have to make it easy or they have to make it not impossible because they want cities to be able to easily go through this certification process and they know it's not as in depth as an architect or an engineer would get on the lead green building certification so because they know it's people like me and people like you like having to track this stuff so I would look at that as well, maybe between green tier and the lead for cities manual, which isn't horribly um, dense either compared to some of their certifications. Those are two tools. Awesome, thank you. Hey, Kelly, uh, this is Steve Jackson. Um, uh, Danelle just brought up the, I think a really good point about, um, you know, systems for reporting. Um, but how do you guys, and I know it's a challenge because you, if you have a lot of data coming in from different sources, what, what, what system do you guys use, or is it not really a system at this point? And what are some of the challenges with getting city staff to, you know, meet these reporting requirements like once a year or twice a year or whatever, uh, frequency? Um, yeah, I, we don't have a great system now. We did have, uh, you know, we did have spreadsheets that were pretty formalized that Slipstream made for us for our first sustainability plan. And then they even came back and we hired them in 2018. I didn't mention this, but we wanted to rewrite our sustainability plan in 2018. And it just got lo lost in the shuffle of staff ch over staff changes and so it kind of fell through, but part of that process is Slipstream again made us tracking spreadsheets with all the metrics we would need to track. So I can send those to you definitely and you can look at them and be like, you know, take this out, take this out, take this out. That might be helpful. Um, and but so right now, I mean, the only thing that we're really tr we're tracking stuff because of lead for cities, but um, we just have been using Energy Star portfolio for the energy side of things. And I actually just last year got um, a small budget allocation for operating to hire an energy consultant service to do energy reporting. So now um, that will be synced with Energy Star portfolio. And then I'll be able to run reports on a number of things like, you know, GHG emissions this month. And, you know, you can tailor it however you want. But it doesn't necessarily, it, you can also use that for tracking water and waste, but we didn't, we haven't it started doing that at all. Um, but I definitely can send you a lot of different tracking spreadsheets, <laughs> if that's helpful, that we currently should be using. But I would say, to answer your question, it's... Um, it's a lot of work tracking metrics for city for city staff. I'm I you know there's even a dedicated sustainability coordinator in my position, and already like I'm working on solar projects with um, project management and you know there's no admin support so that takes almost all of my time. Um, I mean I can't believe how um, how much work it is with sustainability staff, whether it's a designated position or just your planning person or someone having to do this. So I would try to make 
find a system that's easy and minimal to start out with. You can always increase your tracking. Like maybe you should just track what, you know, a certain energy thing, maybe a waste and then water consumption, which you probably have reports for already that would be easy to pull from and then see what you can add if you can do it. If you've done that for a year, I would just start small because it was, it was really overwhelming to all the city staff, how we had set it up originally and we never tracked any, we didn't track it. So it wasn't useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. It makes me think we should almost structure our plan around tracking, you know, around metrics. Mm -hmm. Like we should plan for the things that we can easily measure. Yeah, I think I we I think this iteration is doing that somewhat. And then we there's also some actions which we're going to pursue, but we may not necessarily track with metrics that are um, quantitative. So, um, I mean, we just haven't figured that out yet, but we, we have to in the next two or three months. So I'll send you our final, <laughs> what we've decided. From Stephen, this is Brady, from Stephen and our discussion um, about we're working on energy metrics. Um, and also transportation metrics. And from our conversations that we've had, we kind of seem to have a little bit of a benefit having Stoughton Utilities and being able to access that versus having to deal with the larger corporation of mg and &E. But our transportation metrics seem to be a lot harder to figure that out because finding, getting that kind of information from, Wisconsin DOT would be next to impossible. So have you guys had to approach that, you know, situation with transportation stuff? Yeah, first of all, it was hard getting the VMT, the vehicles mild traveled for specifically Middleton for our lead for city certification. I think they would have accepted a county metric if, and then we would have made a lot of assumptions but we actually were able to get the, what is it, is it CARPC or the local, the regional planning um, group to help us really narrow down for Middleton. But one thing I will say about the transportation is that that issue, what you just were describing, came up in a recent meeting last week that Middleton had in conjunction with the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition. It's a group of um, different, uh, small cities and big cities in Wisconsin that have come together. Stoughton may even be like in the process of joining that group. I'm not sure where you are, but you're oh, you're definitely invited to join that group. But uh, anyway, this group of cities from around the state has been convening and working on larger state policy issues. And one of the biggest issues is that a lot of cities have trouble because we have those utility owned, um, investor owned utilities getting the data, but um, transportation for everyone is a sticky thing that no one can get the information. And so that group has decided to meet with the DOT and talk about a way for all communities to have basic transportation data that's specific to their communities. And it might involve talking, it involves talking to the DOT and I don't know, I don't know if the, I don't think the, I don't know if the PSC was involved, but this group really wants all communities to have the data because we can't really improve or track our emissions if we don't have the data. And so it's great that you have like the Stoughton utilities, but for the transportation that might be coming um, via the work that this group's trying to do with DOT. It's a good time to get involved, I think, in that group because it's gaining clout and um, people have to listen when, you know, 20 communities are demanding a meeting. What was the name of the group? Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition. Um, they have a website. Um, you know, it's a it's only like a year old, and they started with the major cities like uh, Milwaukee and Madison and Green Bay and La Crosse and Eau Claire, and then and now they're they wanted to sort of get their um, structure somewhat launched before they started inviting a ton of people. 
and now they're you know it's it's open to other communities and um, I think they're working on sort of a a plan to promote that and invite communities in a more formal way but it's definitely something that I can put you in contact with them um, we've been able to get meetings with the PSC which have been really helpful and with different government you know legislature um, aides and people who know what's happening um, in the capital so I think and and when you count up the citizens um, that are represented by this group, it's already over a third of Wisconsin citizens. So the legislature has to listen somewhat and um, it's a way to get things done more quickly. But we, that is a recognized problem, the transportation data. Uh, just a quick follow-up to that as well. Um, dealing with those two categories, um, how does Middleton categorize the, uh, city owned fleet emissions? Oh man. Is that yeah. an energy? Because I've seen it, we've seen it in different sustainability plans in transportation or in energy. And I was just curious if you had input on that or if, like, le if for LEED certification, it has to be in a different category or whatever. Right. Um... That's that's a good question because Slipstream really has done a lot of that those calculations for us, and I think they have. It might even be in the appendix of that energy plan how their assumptions for how they figured that um, for each city. I think they you. I, I don't know how where we put that whether it's energy or it's whether it will be an energy or its own fleet thing. But we are right now developing a life cycle cost analysis tool to evaluate fleet replacement choices. And so an engineer on our sustainability committee has sort of, he, he did a ton of research to see if there's a tool that already exists out there. And there were tools that would do this and tools that would do that, but he wanted a tool that could compare every type of fuel source that a vehicle can use and then what the vehicle's used for, and then um, all the options, and then also the, the maintenance costs and the long-term operating costs for those vehicles so that you can plug that in and then evaluate, should we replace this vehicle with gas, EV, hybrid, CNG, you know, what are the options here and what would the cost be? So I think that we'll, we're sort of drilling down into how to evaluate emissions from that now. I think we have time um, for maybe one more, one or can, two more questions. Can, can, can I change yeah, the direction? Ahead, uh, you had a serious flood a few years ago. How, how did people, did the people in the sustainability committee get involved in, you know, this is obviously part of what sustainability is about. And I was just wondering what the reaction in the city was and what the reaction in the sustainability group was. Yeah, that's a really great question because it, it, it was like number one concern in our community. And the sustainability committee really got <laughs> kind of angry and spun their wheels on in a lot of community meetings about we need to find a way to infiltrate more water and and how to slow water through that runs through our community and so there was a ton of analysis done on um, locating soils and open land all around our city in conjunction with our pheasant branch creeks um, and the watershed and they identified the areas um, and I, it wasn't the sustainability committee that did that. It was Water Resources Commission in conjunction with UW students and, um, and other city staff and engineers who identified like places where we could do various different stormwater management strategies, employ those. Um, and so there is, um, what's come out of that is like a creek, a Pheasant Branch Creek um, restoration plan. That's not what it's called, but different it, there's a it's a stormwater plan for how to redo our creek corridor to slow water to infiltrate water we don't have very many places in in our city limits with 
land that we own or have access to to infiltrate water um, or even slow it down. So it's, it's a real problem. And I think the committee has really tried to push other committees to do that work. Like we have a water resources commission and then public lands has really taken that on because we have the big conservancy and lots of public lands that does sort of that work for our city. So um, really the ball's sort of been in the, com the committees for public lands and the water resources commission and the sustainability committee just always pushes them because they don't want to handle everything because they, the engineers and the experts are really on those other committees anyway. So they just push them politically to do more um, with about that. Rachel, can I ask one more question? It's about the plan. Sure. Is a follow-up to Scott's um, kind of question about should we just make our plan based on what we can measure? And I see, we all see the value in inviting the community to be part of writing the comprehensive plan. And I'm wondering if you think from our place here, we haven't really started, we started kind of writing a draft, but would you still have them be separate, like the comprehensive plan and then the, uh, what did you call it? The, the sustainability sustainable plan. city plan. Yeah, is there still value in kind of separating them out? Like we have a big visionary plan and then we have a separate, more specific plan, or would you just put, would you try to combine them if you were starting over? Um, I would, they have, in our city, they definitely have to be separate because I think um, the city's required by law to have a comprehensive plan. And I think that can be different for different communities, but um, the comprehensive plan has like by, I don't know if it's by state statute, but it's, it's requirements, not just preferable. And it the comprehensive plan has to address certain things and they're not all, I mean, that's everything is sustainability in some ways, but they go, it goes beyond sustainability. It's more like housing assessment stuff. And so our comp plan is a separate document and the sustainability plan I think is useful because it um, really narrows that down into a bite-sized chunk of like, this is what we've deemed most important for sustainability for the next three to five years, let's say, because like, like other people have said, like you could talk about stormwater management, you can talk about, I mean, equity should be a part of everything. Um, I mean, I take a really expansive view of what sustainability is. I think it's well-being for all. So when you have that as your definition, that includes public health, it includes food, it, it includes everything. So, but I think the committee was smart in saying, Kelly, <laughs> we need to prioritize we can't do it all in the next two or three years, but we need to know what we should work on in, in, in the next two to three years. So I think it's been useful to have a more um, narrowed plan. And to have them be separate. And to have them be separate, yeah, okay. definitely. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Oh. Looks like yep. Denise has her hand up. She's been through yep. a couple comp plans. Go ahead, Denise. I, I have a question. Um, so Middleton and Stone um, have, I think, probably similar uh, housing mix. We have uh, very old houses, and I think that um, Middleton does too. And um, a lot of energy is used um, by uh, poorly insulated homes, which probably a number of the older homes in your community and our community, you know, probably are, are poorly insulated. And the research has shown that if you don't have, you know, energy efficient um, insulation, windows, et cetera, that uses a lot of energy. So how are you in Middleton addressing that particular issue. Yep, um, we, we're actually now we have, I think, I forget what the housing mix is, we have all that data, but there's so much multifamily housing in Middleton because it's really, they've really focused on making it um, very um, infill development and dense. But what we've done just this year, which I'm really excited about, 
but it's going to be a big project is we allocated about one quarter of our ARPA funding that we got from our the federal stimulus funds towards working on energy efficiency in naturally occurring affordable housing. So that's gonna be things like duplexes, could be single family houses, but it's probably gonna be more like small six unit old housing stock that's existing housing. And um, we're working with Elevate Energy and Sustain Dane on doing energy efficiency work in those buildings with, um, I think it's gonna be $450,000 to do energy efficiency upgrades in that particular housing stock. So it will be affordable housing in Middleton that will get that those funds. And then Elevate is also working on some beneficial electrification projects in Middleton with older housing stock as well to get to upgrade their HVAC to all electric. So are you doing, you know, like any kind of education, public education around um, how people can make their homes more energy efficient and maybe scaling it so that they can, you, you can kind of take a look at if you do certain things at this cost, it'll give you this kind of return, you know, um, because that, that you know from from what I've read you know that's a that's a very big area that really needs to be addressed so yeah. I don't know if your your sustainability yeah. committee has identified that as an area oh yeah yeah um, I don't think there's ever enough public education on that like you could do that solely as a committee and a city staff and it would benefit the community for sure we have this thing called Sustainable U, and it's every month or every other month, and it's run through our library, and the committee organizes it. The Sustainability Committee organizes it, uses the library's vast uh, you know, advertising abilities and user group, and then we, we've been doing it virtually because of COVID, but eventually it will be in person, and we just held an energy efficiency and beneficial electrification um, session and it's an hour long educational session with speakers and resources. Um, but you know, that's just one night and we need to do a ton of those. And then also I need to do a better job of communicating with the public just what the Focus on Energy program provides. Cause I don't think many citizens even know what resources are available and how to make even small changes and be able to pay for that. So. That's something we really need to work on always. Wonderful. Well, you have my wheels turning for sure. <laughs> I'm sure everyone else is too. All right. Yeah, if you don't mind sending over that material um, to Tim or to me, or um, that would be awesome, Kelly. Lots of yeah. good stuff for us to kind of build off of and hear your experience. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Please um, stay in touch. And I think our committee would love to, you know, meet your committee or just, you know, any connections we can make between the towns I've found really helpful. So yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you.